As we can see here, the question about what to do after emancipation was not clean or easy, and groups of people that had been unified during the Civil War, unified for the cause of emancipation, now that they had it, they were splintering into different factions about how to actually go and see this about. Otto Scott was a 20th century Northern writer who observed the radical vindictiveness following the war, including the insistence that the South was out of the Union and not entitled to congressional representation. He said, to win that war and then to refuse to allow the South to remain in the Union was not only logically perverse, but a tacit admission that the war had not been about slavery, but, as in all and every war, power. And in previous podcast episodes, I've talked about the narrative that took hold shortly after the Civil War, that the South wasn't really fighting about slavery, but states' rights. And this view was popular throughout the 19th and 20th centuries because the early histories of the Civil War were written by Southerners, but this has fallen out of favor. So that's an example of that. One of the most contentious issues after the Civil War were the Black Codes, sometimes called Black Laws, which were laws that governed the conduct of African Americans or free blacks. They were passed in 1865 and 1866 by Southern states to restrict African Americans' freedom and to compel them to work for low wages. These predate the Civil War, and many Northern states had them before the Civil War. These laws denied equal political rights, including the right to vote, the right to attend public schools, and the right to equal treatment under the law. White-dominated Southern legislatures in the first few years after the Civil War passed black codes modeled after earlier slave codes. They controlled movement and labor of freedmen and restricted black Americans to certain jobs. There were restrictions placed on intermarriage and concubinage and miscegenation laws. Black codes restricted black people's right to own property, do business, buy and lease land, and move freely through public spaces. A central element of the black codes were vagrancy laws, where states criminalized men who were out of work or not working at jobs whites recognized. At the time, the North had vagrancy laws as well. One stated that one without employment wandering abroad, begging and not giving a good account of himself, might be imprisoned as a vagrant, and they could be imprisoned for periods from 90 days to three years. Northern radical Republicans said that the use of vagrancy laws against freedmen was done in order to keep them in a state of perpetual serfdom. But others argue that it was to end what had become an intolerable situation. A large number of people, a large number of freedmen, were wandering across the South who were without food or money or jobs or homes. And the situation was leading to crime and fear and violence. And there were problems in the North as well. In Illinois, any freedman who couldn't produce a certificate of freedom and who hadn't posted a bond of $1,000 could be arrested and hired out as a laborer for a year. Illinois continued to forbid the testimony of blacks in cases involving whites. And it was only in 1865 that the state repealed the law imposing a fine of $50 on free blacks entering Illinois. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. Well, with the use of vagrancy laws against freed blacks and the claim that crime spiked because there were so many itinerant people wandering around the South, it's worth taking a look at where black Americans went after emancipation. Where did they go? Were there roves of thousands or tens of thousands of people trying to find a new place to live and find work after emancipation. The Library of Congress has an extensive collection on the lives of former slaves after emancipation, and one thing they do is chart the movement of former slaves. And even after the Emancipation Proclamation, after two years of war, after the proclamation from 1863 to 1865, after the service of African-American troops in the Union Army, and after the defeat of the Confederacy, the question of what to do with these newly freed slaves who are now citizens was something that few had an answer to. Congress implemented Reconstruction, which lasted from 1866 to 1877, in order to reorganize the southern states after the war, provide the means for readmitting them into the Union, and to find means by which whites and blacks could live together in a non-slave society. But much of the South didn't welcome Reconstruction. During the years after the war, missionary organizations, churches, schools, black and white teachers from the North and South tried to give the emancipated population the opportunity to learn. Former slaves took advantage of the opportunity to become literate. Grandfathers and grandchildren sat together in classrooms trying to learn to read. After the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, African Americans had a period where they were allowed to vote, 
participate in politics, acquire land of former owners, seek their own employment, and use public accommodations. And during Reconstruction, freed slaves began to leave the South. One group from Kentucky established the community of Nicodemus in 1877 in northwestern Kansas in Graham County. But because of several crop failures and resentment from the county's white settlers, all but a few homesteaders abandoned their claims. It had a population of 500 in 1880, but declined to less than 200 by 1910. The Nicodemus Town Company was incorporated in 1877 by six black and two white Kansans. It was the oldest of 20 towns established predominantly for blacks in the West. There was an exodus of blacks from the South after the Civil War, and these migrants became known as exodusters, and the migration became known as the exoduster movement. They were looking in all directions for places to settle. Some even looked abroad with colonization projects to Liberia and locations outside the United States but others looked in the relatively unsettled regions of the North and West. Benjamin Singleton led a group of African Americans from various points in the South to Kansas. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, we can trace population movements and migration patterns using U.S. Census Bureau data. According to the Atlas for 1890, the heaviest concentrations of non-white populations are overwhelmingly in Maryland and Virginia and southeastern states. But then there are emergency concentrations in northern urban areas in New York, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Toledo, and Chicago, southern Ohio, central Missouri, eastern Kansas, and scattered areas in the west in Oklahoma, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, and California, showing huge migration patterns after Reconstruction. Now, some were able to resettle in different parts of the country, but for many freedmen and freedwomen, they may have had no place to go to very few employable skills, because if they worked on a plantation, they might not have been able to do much beyond simple farming. And hundreds of thousands of freed slaves faced starvation, and many faced death, because they were given almost no resources. Jim Downs wrote a book called Sick from Freedom that shows how dangerous the Reconstruction period was. After the chaos of the Civil War, a lot of the manufacturing and farming infrastructure of the United States was broken. After Union soldiers showed up on plantations to announce the Emancipation Proclamation, these freed slaves were neglected by soldiers, and they faced rampant disease, including outbreaks of smallpox and cholera. A lot just starved to death. Downs argues that about a quarter of the four million freed slaves either died or suffered from illnesses between 1862 and 1870. He calls it the largest biological crisis of the 19th century. Part of the reason this might not be a well-known fact is because many people didn't want to investigate the tragedy of the freed slaves after the Civil War and wanted to feel good about the accomplishment that it happened. Many Northerners weren't terribly sympathetic to the plight of freed slaves, and anti-slavery abolitionists didn't want to highlight what was going on because they feared that it could prove their Southern critics right, that ending slavery abruptly would lead to destabilization and chaos. He writes, in the 19th century, people didn't want to talk about it. Some people didn't care, and abolitionists, when they saw so many free people dying, feared that it proved true what some people said, that slaves were not able to exist on their own. Many freed slaves ended up in encampments called contraband camps that were near Union Army bases. But the conditions were unsanitary, and there were few food supplies. Some contraband camps were actually former slave pens, meaning that newly freed people were kept virtual prisoners back in the same cells that had previously held them. There were countless deaths in these camps and illnesses and disease. And the only way to leave the camp was to agree to go back to work on the slave plantations from which slaves had recently escaped. And Union soldiers sometimes weren't that much better. One freed slave, Joseph Miller, who had come with his wife and four children to a makeshift freed slave refugee camp within the Union stronghold of Camp Nelson in Kentucky, in return for food and shelter for his family, Miller joined the army. But Union soldiers in 1864 cleared the ex-slaves out of Camp Nelson, forcing them to scavenge in a landscape that was completely war-torn. One of Miller's sons quickly sickened and died. Three weeks later, his wife and another son died. Ten days after that, his daughter died. Finally, his last surviving child also fell terminally ill. Miller himself was dead by 1865. Things were so bad that one military official in Tennessee in 1865 wrote that former slaves were dying by the scores, 
Sometimes 30 per day die and are carried out by wagon loads without coffins and are thrown promiscuously like brutes into a trench. The health problems of freed slaves were so bad and the death rates were so high that some wondered if they would all die out at the time. One white religious leader in 1863 expected black Americans to vanish. Like his brother, the Indian of the forest, he must melt away and disappear forever from the midst of us, he said. So emancipation was a complex and difficult process that sometimes wasn't much better than the slave conditions that they had faced before the war. Now, all of this makes it sound like doom and gloom after Reconstruction, which for many people it was, but there were improvements for freedmen and freedwomen in the South. By 1866, most Southern states had enacted statutes to protect a Black's right to hold property, to have recourse to the courts, and to testify in all cases in which at least one party was Black, which was more than existed during the period of slavery when they had essentially no legal rights. Legislators in Southern states called for the liberalization of state policy toward Blacks, even in Mississippi, which had the most stringent Black codes. The Columbus Sentinel, called the architects of the restrictive code, shallow-headed majority more anxious to make capital at home than to propitiate the powers at Washington. They are as complete a set of political goths as were ever turned loose to work destruction upon a state. The fortunes of the whole South have been injured by their folly. Another issue of contention between North and South that emerged right after the war was the honoring and revering of Confederate figures, an issue that still exists today with arguments about Confederate monuments and Confederate street names and naming schools and public locations after Confederate soldiers and generals, saying, why would you honor somebody who was, from one opinion, a traitor to the Union? One radical Republican, Thaddeus Stephen, his friend expressed shock that while they acknowledge themselves whipped and profess future loyalty, he's talking about Southern politicians, Confederate generals are their heroes. Confederate bravery and endurance under difficulties, their pride and boast, Confederate dead their martyrs. In all the stores of Richmond, I did not see the picture of a single Union general or politician, but any number of rebels. Andrew Johnson was a little bit more sympathetic to Southerners, and he at least understood why defeated people would have honored their heroes, even if he didn't completely agree with it. He said, a people should be allowed to grumble who have suffered so much, and they would be unworthy of the name of men if they did not respect the brave officers who have suffered with them and honor the memory of their gallant dead who sleep on a hundred battlefields around their homes. Well, something we'll do is wheel around back to the constitutional amendments that came about after Reconstruction, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, at the time, they were very controversial and another point of division between North and South. The most significant part of the amendment was in the first section. All persons born or naturalized in the United States, and subject to the jurisdiction thereof, are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, or shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. What the first sentence did was extended American citizenship to all persons born in America and subject to its jurisdiction. This reversed the Dred Scott decision that declared blacks not American citizens. Earlier on this podcast, I did an episode where somebody asked me why citizenship isn't automatically granted in Europe and many other countries and it has to do more with your family connections and whether your predecessors were citizens of that country. While America and other countries in the New World do grant automatic citizenship just by virtue of you being born there. And there's all sorts of reasons. Part of it is the approach to what citizenship means in the New World when almost anyone there, unless you're an indigenous person, is an immigrant in some time. But another reason has to do with this, the 14th Amendment, in response to the Civil War so that you wouldn't be denied citizenship if you were a former slave, but if you were born in the United States, then that would make you a citizen. But the remainder of the first section of the 14th Amendment still has controversy about its original intent. Harvard's Raoul Berger has argued that the amendment was modest in scope, and it was intended to empower the federal government to ensure that the states didn't interfere with basic rights of the freed men, the right to enter contracts or sue or own property. James E. Bond argued in the Akron Law Review in 1985 that, according to supporters of the amendment, the civil rights that it protected were the right to contract, to sue, to testify, and otherwise resort to the courts, 
Well, even with this modest scope in mind, Southerners believe that granting powers of oversight to the federal 